Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Uh, Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of things of interest to libraries. Uh, we broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time. But if you are unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show every week, and it is then posted to our website later for you to watch at your convenience. Uh, and I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our archives. Both the live show and the recordings, the archive recordings, are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with anyone, uh, friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone who you think may be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska, and we are the agency for all types of libraries. So you will find things on our show, <coughs> excuse me, um, upcoming um, sessions or previous ones that are for uh, public libraries, K-12, uh, universities, corrections, uh, museums, um, anything and everything. Really, our only criteria is that it's something to do with libraries. All types of libraries, anything we think that may be interested in, services and programs we think they could uh, might want to try out, uh, showing things that other libraries are doing, demoing services, uh, demoing uh, and mini training sessions maybe of things. We do have guest speakers that come on sometimes from across the country uh, to share things with us, and we also have library commission staff that do the sessions, and that's what we have this morning with us. With me today is Sally Snyder, who is our coordinator of children and youth, um, sorry, children and young adult library services here at the Nebraska Library Commission. And she does our regular sessions on best children's books, best teen books with other people, other librarians from across the state. Um, but today we are talking about summer reading for next year. Already we're talking. Yes, because uh, we know you guys need to get going on, if you haven't already, <laughs> uh, getting planned on that. So Summer Reading Program 2019 is, the theme is, a universal story. Space. Auto space, which I think would be awesome. And this one, I don't know if you're going to talk about the, the theme, that it is, um, because it is the uh, anniversary of the landing on the moon, was it the theme? Right, so next year, 2019, is the 50th anniversary of landing on the moon, and that is why they uh, coordinated to have a uh, outer a space themed um, summer reading for the next year. So I think that's awesome. There's going to be a lot of great things going on. Call any astronaut you know <laughs> to come and be a, in some program at your library in DC. <laughs> yeah. Want to be astronaut? Or sure, sure. And you can, you can have an outfit anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and you do mention that um, anything related to STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, is all that's yeah. it's just holds all together so well. Which I think is great with everything that people are really, you know, that's a huge topic now for libraries and school, schools and libraries, um, maker spaces. And, um, but today, Sally is going to share some titles and some books that he's come across over the past. You know, year and every year. Ever since you knew that this was the <laughs> one of my favorite things to do was to read and talk about what I've read. So yay! <laughs> um, just a quick um, summary before we get started. These are books that I have encountered. Either we have some uh, publishers who send review books to the library commission, so I can look through those for our different lists. And um, I look at library books, and sometimes I buy books because I just have to have it. Mm -hmm. And I can't get it any other way anyway, and I'm just going to do that. But these are the ones that I've encountered. There are many others that I haven't run across. So um, you might have a whole nice collection already in your library that you can start with for your theme for next year. And here's some new ones, relatively new ones, that you could think about adding to your collection as you go. I have them put in groups that are kind of loose picture books and then novels for grades two to five or something like that. I can't remember how I broke it down. The current list that I'm going to talk about today will be up on our web page with this um, recording. It's not, there. I, 
think there's one at some conference which doesn't have everything I'm going to talk about today. So there'll be an updated list updated 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 with more titles yeah. to it. Yeah. Okay. So if you're taking notes, you don't have to write everything down. Just jot down things that will help you remember which book was it because it'll have the list has ordering information and things like that to make it easier for you. Mm -hmm. So we'll get started and see how far we get by 11 o'clock. Sure. And we might go to the floor. Yeah. So we'll start with fiction picture books. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Life on Mars. A boy in a spacesuit is exploring Mars, and he has a gift in his hand in case he finds any life there. The reader listener sees the big creature hiding from the boy, but he never does see it. His gift is a box of chocolate cupcakes, and he's hoping he can share it with somebody or something. But he's disappointed in finding no life, and he finally just drops the gift box. And then he's walking back to find his spaceship, and he finds a flower, the first sign of life on the planet, and he's so excited. So he um, spots his spaceship, and he notices that the gift box is right by the, the ladder up to his spaceship. So he picks it up, and he climbs back in, and he's, he heads off back home again. And he opens up the box, because a chocolate cupcake sounds good, but when he opens it, all that's in there are crumbs. Oh, somebody, somebody found it. Yeah, so that's very fun. <laughs> Zelda wants to be the first chicken in space. She asks for help with her spaceship and the building of her rocket, but everyone else in the chicken yard is too busy, a la Little Red Hen. So she flew into space all by herself. When she returned, everyone wanted to know about her trip, and she realized that it had been wonderful, but a little lonely. Perhaps I'll bring some friends next time, she says. And the story ends with an illustration of her spaceship like that, her writing in it, and she's pulling a trailer behind it that's full of her friends. Yeah. So she has a way to bring her friends. <coughs> this is a blend of fiction and nonfiction. The alphabet part is told in rhyme. The capsule is important. It starts with a C, for example. And on each page, also with that little rhyme, there are two to three nonfiction paragraphs in smaller type that give more information about the capsule from blast off, more data, energy, all those different things throughout there. This is perfect for summer and the astronaut slash author grew up in their I was going to say, this is our so, own, our very own Clayton Anderson. Yeah. This is one I bought because I had to have it. <laughs> Charlotte, one of many bunny siblings, is frustrated. Whenever she tries an experiment following the scientific method, her brothers and sisters get in the way or break her speakers and do other things. Her solution? A trip to the moon in a spaceship that resembles a carrot and was built by Charlotte. She finally has time to herself and she can concentrate on her experiments. But then something is wrong. She is lonely. She even misses being squished. She returns home to her family and uses her spaceship as her laboratory, a space of her own. And it does include a two-page spread at the back of the book that explains the steps of the scientific method, and I'm so glad to oh, put that in there to be included. Best friends Pine, a porcupine, and Booth, a bear, are in the forest when an egg falls on Booth's head. It must be from outer space. They have to return it, so Pine builds a spaceship while Booth thinks about what they might name it. After training, they blast off. Well, actually, they slide backwards down the hill and into a cave. Thinking they are in space, they begin to look for the ape's nest and encounter a space monster. Who turns out to be a space mommy whose egg has finally hatched? An invitation to explore the universe, it starts with, there's a tiny little rocket that will take you to the stars. It only flies there once a year, but it zips you out past Mars. You will have to avoid a meteor and zoom past the planets in our solar system to return home. There is one fold-out page at the back of the book that folds out. I think it folds out twice, and that could be damaged with use, but it's great. Well, of course, oh, there's a piece going to space. space. Awesome. That is true. <laughs> he goes to space camp, and he meets several other campers. This is the best part. One of them is named Sally. <laughs> yes. This is the best Pete the Cat book there is. <laughs> I'm prejudiced. They learn about the equipment and they build rockets. And then Pete, Glenn, and Sally get to go on a mission to the moon, where Pete uses a jetpack to zip over to Mars to take some pictures, and he has to hurry back so he can catch the trip back to Earth. Not realistic at all, but it's fun. And it's 
<clears throat> I just have to say, we should have jetpacks coming. Uh, yes, I am very upset about that. Yes, I was sure we were all going to have. Jetpacks. We were promised. We were promised. We were. Where are they? But here's a solution. A boy is bored, and he builds his own jetpack after some trial and error. According to Fly, is tricky, and he knows his mom would want him to build one for his younger brother too. So he does. What a good brother. Then they explore all they can do in the places they can go, school, and to visit Nana. They got permission from their mom for a stone. Then by himself, the boy visits the astronauts at the space station and helps repair it. Then a visit to an alien planet, because you can't go anywhere with a jetpack. Sure. An added bonus is the adverbs included at the end of each two-page spread, clear examples of how they are used, words such as patiently, politely, firmly, persistently, and boldly. This is just so cute. Little alien is not feeling well, and he has two throats, five ears, and three noses. Oh, that's right. So just think about that. <laughs> His parents respond with several treatments for him, the ickiest being the three lunar decongestants who come in with some weird equipment. Little alien's pet Mars Rover, a three-eyed, eight-legged dog-like creature, cannot stand to see his owner suffer, so he puts on a show to make him smile. All of this... After all of this, guess who the, who the next sneeze comes from? Um, the dog, oh, Mars no. Rover. This is a good read aloud choice. Dog and Bunny live next door to each other, but they have different interests and hobbies. Dog's house is red, and he likes to read, and he likes biscuits. Bunny's house is blue. She likes art and cocoa. They see each other every morning, but they never say anything. One night, they are both outside when all at once a shooting star goes by. They are both thrilled and go home and think about it. Then they both go outside to share cocoa and biscuits and be friends. It's lovely and it's all thanks to the shooting star. Mm -hmm. When Stanley's mom has to be gone overnight on a trip for work, Stanley goes outside and gets into a spaceship, mm -hmm. a cardboard box, and travels to Mars. A bit later, the spaceship returns and a being wearing a helmet goes into the house. He is not Stanley, he is a Martian, and Martians do not follow Earth rules. When his mom returns the next day, the Martian travels to Mars again, and Stanley returns, happy to see his mom. And you see with that um, colander, I think it is on his head, <laughs> that is the Martian version of his son. Uh, um, I do want to just, we do have a question, and I did notice that some people did come in after we had started. Oh, okay. um, just want to let people know about the list that you're reading. Yeah, from that, that will be available afterwards, um, with along with a recording that is posted hopefully this afternoon, um, the list of all the books with, you said earlier, about ordering information. Right, that has ordering information. And the list that we'll post with this, the books I'm going to now, some were added since the presentation at conference in October. So right. those have little check marks by them on the, on the right. handout sheet. So there's a handouts page where we have a previous one, but this list that she's working on now that has more titles to it um, will be available to you after, um, when we do the recording. Um, and that's posted. I will have a link to it. And so, we, I don't know, as we said, you know, don't worry about trying to write down everything about the books necessarily. You'll have uh, title, author, publisher information, uh, ordering information, everything you need afterwards. And as I said earlier, maybe just write down any notes about which ones you might be more interested in or, or ideas you have about them. Um, but and then after, um, when we do have the recording ready, I'll email everyone who attended this morning and you all get an email from me letting you know when it is available and that they're on um, the uh, document is up there for you. Great, thank you. Just as we had a bunch of people to come in after we did another little intro. So, yeah. Peter, younger brother of King Felicia, has decided to build a tower of blocks to the moon all by himself. He gets very high, and when it gets dark, he realizes he has no way to get down. In the morning, he ties the blankets together as a parachute and he glides back to Earth just as the tower falls. His parents encourage him to build again, only smaller and safer this time. Pinkalicious tells him he is Peterific. And as far as I know, this is the first book about her brother Peter, mm -hmm. all, all about him rather than her. So perhaps they're going to have a few more about Peter. Yeah. The Korean legend is told on the first page. They see a rabbit in the moon and make a wish. In this book, several animals send wishes to the moon. Their rabbit turns the wishes into stars. Rabbit finds one star left in the basket, and he uses it for his wish. He blows it up like a balloon, puts on a helmet, and floats to Earth. There he meets the animals and has a wonderful time. 
Soon he must return to the moon where again he brightens the sky with stars. One message to him brings a pale peach is a fun surprise from his new friends. It's a telescope so he can look to Earth and see his friends waiting back. Yes, there are more chickens who want to go to space. <laughs> I see a theme here. <laughs> Zoe and her best friend, a pig named Sam, are going to travel in outer space. She invites some other animals, but they all decline. Mm -hmm. Using a basket, some balloons, and their imaginations, Zoe and Sam dodge an asteroid, a baseball, a comet, a kite, and some alien attack ships, birds, which shoot them down. They had a great time, and the other animals want to hear all about their adventure. It's a fun celebration of imagining and exploring. And uh, Zoe and Sam have some other books about trips they've taken. Elmer is walking and enjoying all he sees in the world, but each time someone else comes along, they are too busy to stop and walk with Elmer. The herd of elephants are rushing off somewhere, and later in the book, they are rushing back to go somewhere else. Finally, someone else joins Elmer to gaze at and appreciate the stars in the sky. And it's a very nice, companionable story. In this fantasy, a boy and his cat get up in the middle of the night to witness a blue moon. The boy says, on the night of the blue moon, anything can happen. And so they explore the very blue countryside and are able to go to the moon through its reflection on the lake. Hmm. They have fun, but, the, but since the earth is also blue, they decide to return home. It's mystical and magical. And you could also talk about another meaning of the term blue moon, which is when you have two full moons in the same month. Mm. So you can look at that. And speaking of interesting moon data, here's Good Night, Beautiful Moon. This is from Netflix um, TV show Pub and Rock. Mm. But this is a book. Una is so excited to see her first super moon tonight that she can't stop running around to tell everyone about it and that they should all meet at the burrow at moonrise. When moonrise comes, Una is asleep on the beach. Her family and friends look for her and find her just in time to see the supermoon. So I looked this up because I've heard of the supermoon before, and Wikipedia says it is a full moon or a new moon that approximately coincides with the closest distance that the moon reaches to Earth in its elliptical mm -hmm. orbit. So that it's resulting in a slightly larger, larger than normal. Yeah, so mm -hmm. it looks bigger, but it really isn't. That's what the science is. <laughs> what do we need? I love these books. There's two so far. This is clever fun. Omic and Yelfred are best friends, and they live on another planet called Bobar. Bobor. They have their ups and downs, but remain best friends at the end of the book. The author compares their situations to one on Earth, stating either not like here on Earth, to the statement that teeth are long and tempers are short, or just like here on Earth after friendships can grow back. Her invented language is understandable, and listeners may want to create some of their own words after hearing her story. <laughs> and they have a, a different game that they play that the kids might want to recreate for themselves. Um, the second book is um, um, about school. Olmec is hurt when Yelfred plays with QB at recess and eats lunch with him. But when some other students begin sharing their lunch, throwing it, <laughs> Olmec jumps into the fray to help Yelfred and QB. Maybe it is okay to have more than one friend. Mm -hmm. This is so funny. <laughs> An unidentified voice asks Darth Vader if he is scared of midnight, of a variety of monsters, of children, of one closing the book. It turns out that there may be something that Darth Vader is afraid of. Mm -hmm. Closing the book. <laughs> closing the book. Mm -hmm. It includes clever comments and remarks by Darth Vader. He's also kind of scared of kids. And kids will love the power that book gives them to scare him. <laughs> yes, it is not a new idea to adults, but like, listeners will like it. Some picture book nonfiction. I have a couple here. Mm -hmm. This is about Mae Jemison, and, and it's more of a, an inspiring story of her dreams and wishes and how she did achieve her goal of becoming an astronaut. Uh, but there's not much about study or hard work or anything towards that. It's more of a, a homage to her. Mm -hmm. But I did want to mention something. I read an article about Mae Jemison in the newspaper, and in that she mentioned that when she was young, it, she was inspired and encouraged by the presence and hard work of Lieutenant Uhura on Star Trek. And oh, she thought Lieutenant awesome. Uhura 
can help with the shift there, I can go into space too. Mm -hmm. So it's really important to remember representation. Representation matters, yeah. yeah. Oh, awesome. um, figures. This is a nonfiction picture book designed to share the basics of the women who were the focus of the movie with the same name. And it introduces them in the order they began to work at NASA. Dorothy Vaughn, Mary Jackson, Katherine Johnson, and Christine Darden. Segregation is addressed along with the concept that at the time, women, women were considered less able. The work of each of the women that each of the women undertook is briefly explained and their abil abilities and firsts are noted. There is a timeline and additional brief biographical information included at the back of the book. This is a great introduction to the space program and some of the STEM activities associated with it. Now we get into some beginning readers because Fly Guy, <laughs> this is number 18 in the series, Fly Guy and Buzz enthusiastically make a movie about superheroes Fly Guy and Buzz Boy. They encounter aliens who are trying to capture them. Fly Girl shows up to help Fly Guy and the secret hero court is damaged, but watch for a sequel. I think we need a sequel because there was a bit of a cliffhanger in this one. This is by Dan Gutman. Um, if you can carry the rhythm, the rapping gets a bit much, much for me because it is told completely in rap rhythm, and that is not my strong suit. <laughs> I'm not very good at that. Raffi is kidnapped by aliens at recess, and he is taken to Mars to be the new king, with Janet, the head kidnapper, as queen. How can he get out of this and back to school before he gets into trouble? That is a tough one. I love this set. Um, I bought a six paperback book series for 1065 or something for six books. The first one is Sea Auto. The sixth one is the other book I'm going to talk about, Otto, where Otto comes from another planet and he rides on a spaceship. And then the, the four books in the middle are about Otto's life here on Earth, so they aren't really about space. But six books for $10. That's a great awesome. deal. Yeah. Hey, they're paperback. This is a very basic first reader. The sentences are reminiscent of Dick and Jane. I grew up learning to read from Dick and Jane. Go, Otto, go. Go, go, go. Book one, Otto leaves his parents on his home planet and travels through space on his spaceship. He runs out of fuel and falls to Earth in Africa. And he makes new friends and finds a home here. The sixth book, Otto misses his parents and he builds or repairs a spaceship. His friends on Earth are sad, but Otto takes off. Things go wrong right away. First he goes left and right and dead all over the place finally landing back in Africa to his friend's cheers. This book was the recipient of a Theodore Seuss Geisel Honor Award in 2017. So you can just buy those first and sixth book, or you can buy the whole set if you need more very, very beginning readers. And while you're at it, I would recommend this one, also by David Milgram. This is the first book in a new series, or what is proclaimed to be a new series. And it is similar in that the sentences are pretty basic. In this one, Zip performs a magic trick, first for his dog, Chip, who claps, and then for his younger sibling, Zip, who proceeds to nap. Uh, this, Zip is unhappy that Zip is not enthralled with his, his magic, so he tries harder and harder, and he creates a monster out of the hat, and then Zip has to save them both, which is kind of fun. Oh, yeah, we had chickens. We didn't have space yeah, cows. Sure. This is simple text again for beginning readers. Things like space cows fly high, space cows fly low. Cows with different colored spacesuits and helmets float about above a planet and about. And also, the cows are in and out of space, and there are different colors. You see, the first two closer ones are both black and white, but the guy in the background, he's green and white, so they, mm -hmm. they're not all the same. And that's pretty much all they do is go around. <laughs> but that's fun. Lana asks her parents and older brothers to go with her to the moon. They are busy with yard work or playing, so they say, you might float away, or the moon is lonely. She goes to her room, prepares, and goes to the moon by herself. Just when she decides the moon is lonely, up walks the man in the moon, the woman in the moon, and two moon boys. They have fun and adventures before Lana decides to return to Earth where she and her family make moon cookies. So her family did come through for her after. Some early chapter books. 
This is book four in the Hildy Preps, the case series. Hildy is, um, does reporting, and she is a real life young girl who does have a blog of reporting. And her father had been a reporter, and he had helped her write books. But she is very to the letter about reporting, and, and rumors won't cut it. <laughs> no. Do your research. Yes. A bright flash in the sky soon has a town in an uproar. They all say a UFO is in. Philly is looking for facts for her online newsletter, but she and her sister, who does her photography for her, keep encountering rumors and nothing substantial. But they haven't given up yet. Then we have the five minute Star Wars stories. I put this in this category because they're short stories about Star Wars movies. So there are 11 snippets from seven various movies. The writing and artwork are fine, and the illustrations dominate the pages. But for your information, <clears throat> a couple of times it does give away some important plot points or overall movie endings. Ooh. So kids, you might want to you know, tell people that your kids see the movie yet because they're going to find out something. Yeah. Along with that, Spoilers. is the Strike Smack second book, which has 12 <laughs> snippets from eight various Star Wars movies, including The Last Jedi. And once again, they're very similar. Um, and they do give away a few things to these stories. But for reminiscing about seeing the movies, this would be fine. Some fiction titles. Oh, speaking of Star Wars, here we go again. Tom Engelbarger's murder has written The Mighty Chewbacca. Han is being held hostage, so Chewbacca agrees to take a shipment of Tuka cats to an unknown planet where he and the companion forced on him, Maeve, soon find themselves in deep trouble. The forest trees are soothing, but there is a mist that causes fear for those who encounter it. And several different things want to eat them. <laughs> so <laughs> standard. Yeah. <laughs> you know, go to climate, something's going to want to eat you. This is wonderfully written. It's set in 1969. It's told in letters from Maine, which is 10, to astronaut Michael Collins, first about the upcoming moon landing in July, and then about her personal situation. She feels connected to him because he must stay by himself orbiting the moon while Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin walk on the moon. Um, her, her teacher before school got out had everybody in her class write a letter to one of the astronauts. Mm -hmm. So all the boys wanted to write to Buzz because he has a great name. And all the girls wanted to write to Neil because he was handsome. <laughs> and she's <laughs> like, what? Michael well, Collins? We left out. I'll write to Michael Collins. So, but she keeps writing to him just kind of talking about her situation. Mamie first feels left adrift and then actually is left alone at home when her mother leaves her father and he leaves to catch up with her. Her older sister now lives in another town and 16-year-old Bess is always off with her boyfriend. But her best friend Buster lives next door and he is her um, steadying influence. The moon walk and splash down bring people together and Mamie's steadfastness is rewarded at the end. It's a lovely book. And this author is a great friend to talk with because we've gotten to have a Skype visit with her. Oh, at the some, uh, Southeast Library System summer reading program workshop. So mm -hmm. maybe you might be able to have a Skype visit with her for your summer right. activities mm -hmm. and check into that. This is set in England. Prez, Preston Mello, has been living in temporary housing since his grandfather, whose memory is slipping, was taken to a home. This summer, Prez will live on a farm with the Noisy Blythe family. One evening, he answers the door and he finds a funny looking kid in a kilt and aviator goggles. He is an alien on a mission to Earth to find 10 things that make Earth worth saving. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it will be destroyed. <laughs> well, you know, every, everyone else thinks the kid Sputnik is a clever dog. The first thing Sputnik, the things that Sputnik thinks are worthwhile are completely different from Prez's opinion. So every time Prez says, well, what about this? He's like, well, that's not important. I don't know why. You. But he gets all excited about things that Prez thinks is just, you know, average everyday stuff. So it's a lot of fun. As Kirkus says, the overall themes of home, family, and one's place in the universe are reflected in moments of sweetness, which is a nice thing for Kirkus. <laughs> Catronauts. <laughs> okay, cat. Good cat. Chickens and cows. cows. Now cats. Don't cats. worry, dogs are coming. <laughs> this is a full color graphic novel. There are four books so far in this series. This is book one. There is a huge energy crisis, so the plan is to build a solar, solar power plant on the moon. They have 60 days for training, building, and starting at the power plant. Who do you call? The world's best scientist calls the catstronauts. Waffles, blanket, pom-pom, and major meowter. They work for catsup. 
Center for Aeronautical Technology and Space Underlying Programs. That was hard work to do that. There are some setbacks, but they have, there's still a chance they could succeed. Book two is Race to Mars. Um, it turns out that, that uh, cats up, the um, astronauts are not the only cats in space. All the characters in this book are cats. Um, there are three other organizations that have astronauts. And everybody wants to get to, the, to Mars first. So there are four ships headed for Mars. The Russians are ahead of everybody. And we have a terrible crash in space. The other three all crash into each other and they have to scrap their spaceship to put together one that they can survive in and so hold on. Mm -hmm. But they're going to need some help when they get to Mars and the only people who can help them are the Russians. But moving on, space station situation. The, the Hubba Bubba telescope isn't working right and they have to get up to the space station so they can work on the telescope. And the uh, cats are hard after it. Castro, it's a hard after that. Then book four is Robot Rescue. Castrobot has been with the Castronauts through it all, but now he's stranded on Jupiter's coldest moon after a mission gone wrong. And his best friend slash creator blanket isn't going to leave him behind. He is going to go get Castro. <laughs> Lucy has built her first rocket ship, Prototype 1, in the backyard. Going in for supper, she is dismayed to hear the rocket blast off and realizes her beloved dog, Laika, is inside oh, and accidentally pushed a button. <laughs> the story is told ultimately from Lucy and Laika's points of view, and this is a demonstration of Einstein's theory of relativity. It is also humorous, Laika's trip, and inspirational, Lucy's successes. And it all comes right in the end. It includes black and white illustrations. What happens is Laika has a trip of several weeks into a couple of months, and, and then gets back to Earth. And during that time, Lucy has lived most of her life. She's an older woman mm -hmm. who's had many achievements. When the spaceship lands and Laika, the dog, gets out just a couple, three months older, and um, they're reunited. Mm -hmm. And I thought, this is a great way to demonstrate yeah. that. Yeah. <coughs> mm -hmm. yeah, watch out. If a black hole follows you home, be careful. Stella Rodriguez is 11 and is followed home from NASA by a small black hole. She went there to talk to Carl Sagan, but he was not available. It is 1977, and she had a suggestion for his golden record he was going to send in the space. Ah, great. Larry, as she names him, the black hole, just wants to cuddle, but in that <coughs> attempt, he ends up swallowing things. Aww. Her father recently passed away, and through dealing with the black hole and her younger brother Cosmo, she also works through her grief for his death. Unusual and fun, Stella and Cosmo are accidentally swallowed by the back hole, black hole for a while and have some strange adventures while inside. This is entertaining and philosophical. Isn't he cute? <laughs> Poor Larry. <laughs> yeah. This is set in England. Jamie is proud of his father who is on the International Space Station and will perform a first ever event on his spacewalk. Jamie visits a local observatory after his father had mentioned it to him. It's been close for years, but while there, he encounters uh, a lady who's doing some other research, and he plugs in his phone because it's almost out of power. But then he finds a strange signal on his phone. It seems to him that aliens are contacting him. Could it be true? And could this actually affect his dad's mission? Jamie accidentally hears his mom and dad talking and learns they are planning a separation after his dad's return from space. This makes Jamie angry because they haven't talked about it with him. But when the mission goes wrong, Jamie does what he can to help, and the aliens will help too. This is a three book series by Stuart Gibbs called Moonbase Alpha. In the first book, Dash Shield Gibson 12, he lives on the moon with his family and about 25 other people. It sounds great, but actually, all children are confined to the building, never allowed outside on the moon. It's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And the food is so processed, dried, compacted for transport to the moon that it all tastes awful. You can't tell what you're eating by taste. Oh. A favorite fellow lunar nod of Dash's is Dr. Holtz. One day they find, it found, they find him outside the base dead. Believing his helmet was not attached correctly, the adults think it was an accident, but Dash does not. He is working in secret to discover what really happened. Dash is a likable character and the mystery is well constructed and developed. In book two, spaced out. Dashiell Gibson uh, and his other people are st still on the moon, still surviving. When one day, Nina, the moon base commander, disappears. 
no one can locate her, and this leaves a second mystery for Dash to tackle because he knows spacesuits only last so long. Mm -hmm. So we go out on the moon, and you only have this so, so much, much time. Oxygen, yeah. yeah. And you're on them. So they're very concerned. Book three, on Dash's 13th birthday, Lars Solberg was poisoned with cyanide. He recovered, but now everyone is a suspect because he and his family are so awful. They've been on the moon base all this time. They spent almost a billion dollars to be the first moon tourists mm -hmm. and have treated everyone like servants and complained about all the discomfort on the moon. Nita, the base commander, asked Dash, Dash to help solve the mystery, but now it looks like they will all have to abandon the station and return to Earth. For some unknown reason, the oxygen system is not functioning properly. Only down by one or two percent, but that's something to be concerned about, and it could get worse. It's another satisfying mystery and a strong finish to this series. More full color graphic novel. Cleopatra, yeah, that Cleopatra, is preparing, preparing for her 15th birthday party when suddenly she is transported from Egypt to a different planet in the future. She is the one who will defeat the evil Octavian after plenty of training. Going to school is no picnic, in her opinion, because she's never had to do it before. <laughs> but she does have a lot to learn, and weaponry, it turns out, is her best class. Her first mission should have been just recovering some historical data from somewhere, but Cleo's mission is much more dangerous. There are, I think, going to be at least five titles in the series. The fifth one comes out in uh, next year, early, maybe February. In this one, Cleopatra retrieved a sword from her, from her first mission, but now a bold young thief has stolen it from her. It turns out he was hired by Octavian, the evil commander directing the Zerks invasion that is consuming all planets one by one. It turns out the sword is a fake, but Cleo will need the real one to fulfill her destiny. This one ends on a cliffhanger, but don't worry because book three's out. All right. All right. <laughs> Cleo and her friends travel to the planet Hycosis to try to find one of the time tablets. Octavian is not far behind. This volume includes a surprising reveal of Octavian's past. And, oh yes, the book four is out, but I haven't gotten a hold of a copy of it. And book five will come out in March of next year. Not just nine. More stuff happening. It is July of 1947. Milo and his best friend Debs investigate the reported finding of a crashed flying disc near their home in New Mexico. They return later with three more friends, and Milo goes inside the disc, finding an injured alien, but his friends pull him back out, and they have to run away before they're caught there by the military. Milo has begun occasionally hearing a voice in his head saying, Help! And he feels they must try again to help the alien. It gets more complicated when the military takes takes the disc and everything from the site. I mean, everything. A new twist, an uninjured alien girl has followed Milo home. So now what does he do? <laughs> Kel Kelvin Cosmo, about 12, his younger sister Beulah, and his genius parents have just arrived on the Galactic Science Hub. Kelvin must start another new school, his fourth in the last five years. Everyone expects that he's a genius too because of his parents, but right now he's pretty average. Keeps hoping it's going to kick in. <laughs> but no one realizes is that super evil Eric Thalenheimer traveled with them to the space station. He is planning to rule the universe and is stunned when the welcome bot says he is assigned to be a custodian for the, for the station. Soon enough, Eric takes control of Kelvin's dad's giant robot as step one of his plan. Unfortunately for him, Kelvin and his school friends are in the lab and manage to hide inside the robot's foot. Can they foil his scheme? The illustrations are in black and white and are included on almost every two-page spread. And book two is called Crash Landing, where, yes, once again, Balenheimer is back, and they have to um, see if they can overcome his most recent plan to take over the universe. Oh, yes, and there are things like the school dance to pre prepare for. There's still plenty of illustrations and typical middle school situations, along with alien viewpoints and plans. Oscar is a bench warmer. He invariably executed an error the few times he played, so the coach keeps him on the bench. This is baseball team. He is a positive influence on the team and is always upbeat, cheering everyone on and making Oscar aid for each game. Then his elderly late neighbor gives him an old watch as a thank you the same day the coach has to put him in the game. No choice. Mm -hmm. He uses the watch to stop time, a total of 19 seconds, 
for him to hit the home run and win the game against their obnoxious rivals. But now, weird things are happening. Pterodactyls mm -hmm. are flying around, just for 19 seconds. <laughs> and a second sun is on the way to our solar system, all because of those 19 seconds. Mm -hmm. Now Oscar has to fix the universe, or we are all doomed. It's humorous, wacky, and philosophic. Jameson, 11, in fifth grade, misses his father, who is now on Mars. An asteroid caused a freakish change to several planets' orbit, and now Earth is getting closer to the sun. A mission to get as many people as possible to Mars has been underway for several years. When a new family moves in across the street, Jameson learns the mother died in an accident on Mars. He meets Astra, who is now in his classroom at school, and finds her tough and prickly. They become friends, though, and soon Astra is helping Jameson try to fix his communicator device, which is how he sent messages to his dad. Mm -hmm. They couldn't get, they couldn't have a conversation, but he could send messages, and then his dad would send messages. And second, he wants to sneak on board the next mission to Mars, sneak aboard and go to Mars just to see his dad. There they are. There is dogs in space. Said dogs were home. <laughs> Like a spaceship is traveling to another star system with humans and dogs on board. The goal is to colonize a habitable planet Earth is calling Stepping Stone. But when the four dogs wake up from their long sleep, the humans are gone and the Lyca is damaged. Working together, the dogs repair what they can of the ship and cut off the damaged sections. Things keep going wrong though and they are certain they will never complete their mission. But Barconauts do not quit <laughs> and maybe there is still hope. Supporting each other, continuing to cry, and keeping hope alive are the cornerstones of this adventure. And somewhere in the book, it does mention that these dogs were genetically altered, so this is have the ability to do mm -hmm. the things that they're doing. Yeah. So I think that was to discourage you from trying to teach your own dogs how to <laughs> fly a spaceship. And, you Repair know, Why not try? I do like the little subtitle: "Boldly go where no dog has gone before." <laughs> it says on the cover. <laughs> he, he has his tools with him. Mm -hmm. These are the dogs you want with in this fish. Yeah. This is book one and so far a two book series. There might be more. Alara 12 is from a remote farming planet, very far from the bustling main planets of the sector, so she is not well versed in communicating or understanding the communication preferences of other beings. Now she is ready and excited to attend the Seventh System School of Terraforming Sciences and Arts, or STS. She encounters new friends, a few bullies, and finds that learning terraforming is trickier than she expected. Oh, and maybe one of the professors is up to no good. <laughs> Possible. Book two, Laura went home for the school break, and now she's getting ready to go back to school. She's missed her friends since her home planet is so far away. But on her way back to school, she discovers that the STS has been closed, and the classes are now being held on a ship with only robots as instructors. Hmm. Everyone else is in line with the new regime, but Alara is suspicious and keeps trying to find out what is really going on. She becomes alienated from her friends and realizes that she has to try a different approach. Finally, there is more evidence that something wicked is happening, but now, can Alara and her friends save the school and the students? We hope so. Some nonfiction for grades two to six or so. Good basic information includes Braden's journal, which is one of the students. Um, he notes facts and definitions of words like galaxy, gravity, planet. Each are a, a small inset on certain pages, so it kind of brings together stuff that they've discovered and helps solidify that. As it says on the front cover, walk on the moon, fly with a satellite, gaze at comets, and discover why Pluto isn't a planet anymore. Hmm. I have issues with that. Me too. <laughs> but Pluto's gotten over it from what I hear. Hmm. This is a full color graphic novel style nonfiction. A groundhog and a worm, who provides a comic relief, tell the history of our planet beginning with the Big Bang. It's a good start for readers interested in our Earth, geology, and some of the scientists who are featured occasionally in brief asides titled Deep Time Comics. This book looks at enormous numbers and gives the reader a sense of the size of the numbers using stars, our planet, people, and more. Returning to space often, this is a starting point for the concept of large numbers that lets readers begin to think about stars, ants, and how people estimate their numbers. Because nobody, I bet you a nickel, nobody has counted all the ants. <laughs> this is a full color graphics novel style nonfiction. 
A brief look at some of the qualities of the planets in our solar system, including the sun and the earth. The pets are a bit cutesy in my opinion, opinion, but the information is good. The animals present a report on the sun and each planet as they travel past them that reinforces the facts that were wrong. The Kuiper Belt and its dwarf planets are mentioned, especially Pluto, which they mention here is smaller than Earth's moon, which mm -hmm. I didn't know and knew before I never paid attention. This is a beautiful book oh, and full of information yes. about the Mars rover Curiosity in particular. Still so, going strong. Yeah, still mm -hmm. running. And that's great because on August 6, 2012, it touched down on the rocky surface of Mars, and now she's ready to guide you through her journey. And she, um, they talk about how she was built, something, some about previous rovers and how they were built and their functionality. And the fact that she is still cruising, looking mm -hmm. at stuff is great. This is the book coming. I, I'm not getting a kickback, but everybody needs this book. <laughs> After a welcome and a few pages of basic information about being in space, the astronaut author gets right to the number one question they are asked, asked which is, how do you go to the bathroom in space? <laughs> Illustrations, photos, and text are used to answer it. Photos of the equipment, not anybody actually using it. <laughs> or yes. Yeah. It all, along with information on the maximum absorbency garment, mag, or diaper. Because mm -hmm. when you go out on a, on a spacewalk for eight hours, yeah, you can't say, oh, I'll be right back. Yeah, you know, I can't go you know. back inside and go back out again. Yeah. How they bathe? No, they don't have a shower. Mm -hmm. They use a towel for a sponge bath approach. The dangers of how they brush their teeth, which is also interesting. And the dangers of burping or farting while in space. Mm. It's not going to explode anything, but there can be repercussions that you might not enjoy. Mm -hmm. This information full book is sure to be popular because it tells the things that kids so often want to know. A few teen titles, starting with fiction for younger teens. When the booth came, they offered peace and free advanced technology and cures for every illness. Who would say no? I mean, we're going to be taken over anyway. Let's at least say yes. <laughs> However, the rich do nicely, and everyone else loses their jobs because technology does it better. When Chloe, her brother and father, move into Adam, his younger sister and mom's house, their dad ran off. Adam and Chloe fall in love. They discover a way to finally make some money. The Vogue do not have love and have a 50s TV sitcom slash teen movie view of what love is. So Adam and Chloe provide a subscription televised view of their dates. They're very cheap and they don't have any holding. But that's, that's all. This is great until they can't stand each other anymore. Adam pays for his art class, and his teacher enters him in a group sponsored art contest. Maybe that will save his family. It's unusual, thought provoking, hopeless, and hopeful. Try to find out who you are with an alien culture overset on your life and how you and your family can survive in the current way things are. Anderson provides a unique look at alien invasion and human survival. But he's always had an unusual approach to stories. This follows one. Alex Petrovsky is 11, and he and his dog Carl Sagan take the train to near Albuquerque, New Mexico to participate in a rocket launch event. Alex has been recording sounds on his golden iPod, which he intends to send into space mm -hmm. as an homage to the golden record that was in, mm -hmm. in 1977. But he encounters some kind and helpful and some not so helpful people along the way. Slowly, it is revealed that his home situation is not good and his mother is unable to care for him. Gullibility, heart, caring, tough discoveries, and helpful strangers abound. Alex is 11, but some of the topics in the book are for older readers and his home situation is that his mother is medic, um, mental to, mm -hmm. to take care of him. This is the first book in what might be a three book series. There's at least more than two. I have two books here. I know they're not done. But they are. They're going to have a bunch of people mad at me. <laughs> Liam is 13, and he and his friends have lived on Mars all their lives. The sun is going to go supernova much earlier than expected, and the colonists on Mars are preparing for a 150-year trip to a planet humans can live on. Yeah. The final day on Mars, Liam's family and his friend Phoebe's family must conduct one more test before leaving the surface and joining everyone else on the transport ship. Then things go wrong. An explosion rocks the colony. 
Liam and Phoebe are worried about their parents and must find a way to save them. There's lots of action and trouble in the second half of the book. The first half is more about setting things up. So it might seem a little slow, but it's interesting because mm -hmm. they're on Mars. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the sequel is The Ocean Between Stars. Liam and Phoebe barely escaped the exploding sun and have <coughs> been in a, in a stasis for a decade long journey to the rogue planet Delphi, where they hope to be back with the rest of the human refugees and the transport ship. They need to find help for their injured parents, who they have in stasis as well. And um, they have to let other people know the things that they discovered on Mars. But Phoebe is carrying her own dark secret, and one that finds her waking up secretly at various points in their journey, changing their path a little bit through space. It is a secret that will decide the fate of the human race and many more besides. And she's going to have to reveal it to him pretty soon, whether he's ready or not. And this book ends on a, obviously a cliffhanger, so there's got to be more. <laughs> please be mad. At age 16, it is time for the ceremony of the Day of Demand for Leia, a first step before becoming named heir to the throne. After declaring her three challenges, Leia must work toward accomplishing them while continuing to represent Alderaan in the Apprentice Legislature. She begins to discover that people are working to fight the Emperor, and she must be careful both with her challenge choices and with what she says. Fans will enjoy her introduction to the rebellion and her approach to, dis to diplomacy. There are also a couple of hints of the course in her life, but she is not aware of I really enjoyed it. I have, I actually have that book. I have, um, Buddy Gray is a great author of, that does a lot of Star Wars books, um, young adult level Star oh, Wars novels. Cool. Yeah. But that, this was a good one. Nicola Cross, 13, has trouble making friends. She has had an unusual life so far, but it is about to get weird. Her brilliant father is kidnapped by apparent aliens, and she is driven to a secret boarding school to keep her safe. The school provides an education for extremely intelligent humans and parahumans. They're part alien. And is protected from attack using numerous devices, such as a swarm of bees. I'm <laughs> large in if you know. Yeah. Humor is clever, and it is not out of the question that there could be more titles on the way. And I'm pleased to announce that the unspeakable unknown will be out in January. Yeah. So, yeah, more titles. Some nonfiction for teens. In the science comic series is this one about rockets. Full color graphic novel style nonfiction, starting with our published oh, practices, Architas, 400 BC in Italy, who first used steam to blast a rocket. The readers learned the history of rockets and the principles under which they worked. Again, Anna Moult explained the history, but this one doesn't seem as cutesy to me, maybe because I read it first. And probably more likely because some of the information, while well explained, is advanced for me. And I am <laughs> not my <laughs> cup of tea. But it's really good about rockets and information. This was fascinating. It's a, the Apollo 8's original mission was to orbit the Earth and test the lunar landing module as another step toward landing on the moon. But Russia was planning to send a ship around the moon. So with only four months to go, mm. we completely changed our mission. Now we would orbit the moon first. Training equipment all changed and was redirected to support the new mission. In four months to get prepared That's for something right. completely different. It's surprising. This uh, trip included Frank Borman, Jim Lovell, and Bill Anders. And this trip around the moon, uh, that's when we got the original Earthrise photo, which many of us have seen in cultures, etc. It's a fascinating book, and it really um, sets the pace for what came later. A couple of fiction books for older readers. It is 2065, and Avery, 17, is finished with her studies and has now been sent for a three-month visit with her formerly unknown distant cousin in Kansas as part of her final preparation for saying goodbye to Earth. She is one of a handful of team members heading to a new colony on Mars. Her cousin is old and has been slipping into dementia, but she is thrilled to meet Avery. The history Avery learns of her family and their friends through letters are, is through letters written and saved. From 1934, Kansas and the Dust Bowl, from 1919, England, and World War I. While space is on the back burner, aside from her weekly visits to the center for contact with her fellow travelers, Adley absorbs the stories of her past and hopes she can learn how all of their stories ends. 
before she goes on to Mars. And I think it's appropriate we end with a farce. <laughs> um, told in memos, emails, video logs, and transcripts of meetings, phone conversations, and the actual reality TV show title, Waste of Space. The premise was to put 10 teenagers in a spaceship circling the Earth, except that they are really in an enclosed soundstage warehouse in the desert. But they think they are in space, at least. Some of them, they all think that at first, and some of them. They want to start figuring out something's not right. <laughs> yeah. They have great ratings until something goes wrong. All communication is severed, and the teens have to figure out what is going on and what they should do. Mm -hmm. Chaz, the CEO of the Cable Channel, is consistently offensive and clueless. Mm -hmm. and, um, interestingly, it's just the time for us to be done. Mm -hmm. I do on the list, you'll see that I have some older titles and series titles included that mm -hmm. you might be interested in, but I wasn't going to talk about them today because mm -hmm. I thought I'd go too long. And I forgot to mention that, yes, I read from the script because otherwise we would be recording oh. for three hours and the person <laughs> would say, Sally, just, just go away now. No, uh, no, no. Because I just keep babbling. So this keeps me on track and, and mm -hmm. I tell you the things I think are important for you to know and then I move on to the next mm -hmm. post. So are those blurbs included for the ones you post? Not yet, but yes, I'm okay. kind of planning on doing that. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The first list you'll get will just be the list of books that mm -hmm. I will put together. It takes a little bit of time to file that together. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. So um, so that is our uh, list of titles for summer reading next year. Um, not an exhaustive list, as you said, just yes, that we, just Sally's come across. <laughs> um, anybody have any questions or thoughts or titles that you um, have that you um, might want to share. Um, oh, we do have a comment. Someone says, so many books to buy. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Sometimes it is, and I, I love these, these shows that uh, Sally does as well. It's usually in the fall, as you mentioned. Um, we have our annual state conference in October usually, and Sally does a session on summer reading program titles, specifically for whatever the upcoming uh, theme is, and then a, a session on children's books and teen books. And she, the children's one actually has been done, and the team is coming um, January 2nd. Coming up, but it's good timing. Um, unfortunately, with the team one being active, and usually to the holidays, I get lots of ideas for um, books to buy for any of the kids that I might be buying for. You want to see my notes? List? Yeah, I can, yeah, get a head start on the notes. Yeah, <laughs> um, and so I love Sally's book lists. Awesome. Yeah, all right, so um. Yeah, I think that'll wrap it up for everybody. Thank you so much, Sally, for this. So, um, this list will be, um, oh, let's see, we have here. Uh, has anyone had any success? Uh, someone does say, great list, and does have a question. Speaking of Clay Anderson, has anyone had any success getting in contact with him for programming? Do you know anything about it? I know him? a little bit about that. Um, it depends on, I know some people contacted and there were some astronomical prices, like $25,000 to mention. And other, um, Scott Childers at Southeast Library System, apparently talked to somebody else because they said, well, we'll see what the schedule's like and what you might want, and it's possible we could do some pro bono visits, but we don't know for sure, and we're not promising anything. Mm -hmm. So um, it's everything from maybe to, oh, we don't have that. We can't afford it. Nobody can afford it. I can't even <laughs> give you a youth grant for excellence for that. No. I'm, not just, I'm not saying it's not worth it. I'm just saying we don't have that much money. Mm -hmm. Well, hopefully it's more... People, you know, somebody explains to them what's going on, that this is this theme for the kids, that there might be some, um, just wanting to help out his home state and do these things and not worry about the, but be all he nice. can do is ask. So. But he, apparently he's getting booked up. Pretty it, I'm not surprised. I mean, I'm sure he would, just in general, he has a very busy schedule, so. Um, all I can say is try and see <clears throat> and see what. Um, and I don't know what a Skype is. possibility. I don't know if that makes any Skype or Zoom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. Yeah, a lot of people using Zoom and Skype with the authors is all the time. Yeah, um, that makes it a lot easier when it comes to travel and all those other costs. So if that's something that you can do or suggest to him, um, that might be a, an easier way to go. Um, but unfortunately, we don't have any real good tips about. <clears throat> <clears throat> what has been going on with it? <laughs> so that's, that's that's all I've heard lately. Yeah. So disheartening, but don't yeah. give up. Mm -hmm. All right, so thank you. 
All right, thank you, bad ideas for books, absolutely. All right, so as we said, this will be the, the this this, uh, this list will be on the website uh, on our archive when we do post it this afternoon. Um, I'm going to escape over there, so and I'm going to switch to um, our website here to show you. Uh, this is the Library Commission's website. And we do have our Encompass Live page off of here. You can also use your search engine. You can either search on our website or just use any, wherever you like to use to look up Encompass Live. And so far, we're the only thing called that on the internet. Um, this is our main page where you will see here's our upcoming shows uh, for December and going into January of next year. But right underneath the list of upcoming sessions is our archives. And this is a um, list of all of our archives. Um, the most recent ones are at the top of the list here. So this is last week's. And uh, the one for today will be right here at the top as soon as I get the, the recording all processed and good to go. It will be here and you'll be able to access it from there. And along with that will be, there will be a link, as you're seeing the link to recording, a link to presentation, the link to recording, a link to the slides that Sally has, and another link, a third link to the handout page where we do keep all of these. Um, and we actually have, there is, uh, If you do search for handouts, this is a page that we do have on the Library Commission site that Sally uses to post all of her um, handouts for all the various things she's done. So That's what I'm going to talk about a little bit here. We have the summer reading. Oh, that's okay. So, so you can. Yeah. Yeah. So, to so here's, oh, so there's an extended handout for the children. Yeah. So this is where um, things are. Now here's one she did the, as we as I mentioned uh, we did the best new children's books of 2018 was already done, and the archive is already available for that. That was done um, in November. Best new teen books is coming up in January, uh, and here's you know, as you see here Sally's session um, handout for conference, and then also previous years. This is where she's keeping all her historical ones. If you're looking for anything older, um, just her best new lists for teens and children over the years, um, and whatever was the um, summer reading program for each of those years. So um, we talked about in. getting some of those older ones just to take them off of there because you really need to know what the 2011 list was. I don't know. We can look at it and see what yeah. we think is a. I don't know if it, I think it goes through four. Mm -hmm. This goes all the way back to 2008, actually. Yeah. See, that's what I did. So. Mm -hmm. Children and teens all in one handout. Yeah, we split them up now. There's just so many. <laughs> I try to do it all in one section. Yeah. So in our archive here on Encompass Live, you'll see um, that there is a search. You can search the most recent 12 months or everything. Uh, this is 2018. We're wrapping up the 10th year of Encompass Live. There is 10 years worth of archives here on our archive page. That's a lot, yes. And uh, so you will find things that are old, historical. We are librarians, so we are an archivist, so we save everything as much as we can. So and you'll see everything has a date though on it. So you can tell if you go all the way back or you search for something and you find that it's old. Um, be aware of the date that things were public, were originally broadcast because uh, some things may be um, the service might not exist anymore, some links might be broken, uh, it might be old, outdated information, but it is still out there for historical purposes. So Maybe just, they said that Pluto is a planet. I'm sure there was something in the past where we did. <laughs> um, but you can search for just recent um, sessions and just the most recent 12 months uh, if you want to for that. I didn't realize like we had that choice. <laughs> That's something new. We just added that kind of search separation in the last six months or so, sometime this year, yeah, no, because it's just gotten so huge and unwieldy, it's just a gigantic list of things. Um, we do Encompass Live every week of the year, usually, except for the week that we have our state conference. So there's one, so you can, um, 51 a year, or when we have certain situations randomly where we've had technical difficulties, uh, we actually, um, the first session for December, was actually canceled because we were, as a state agency, we were closed because of the day of mourning for President Bush. And that one was actually supposed to be our best new teen books of 2018, and it got rescheduled for January 2nd. So if you were interested in that one, it was originally beginning of December, due to the fact of us being closed for the day, it's been rescheduled for January 2nd. So if you're interested in some more titles for your teens, this is just general, but this isn't specific to the summer reading. Right. Um, you can sign up for that one or for any of our others. 
two sessions there. Also, we are on Facebook, so if you're a big Facebook user, pop over there, give us a like. I post updates to sessions here. Here's one to remind you to log into today's show. Um, when our recordings are available, I post on here. Here I posted when we rescheduled the one that was for uh, the team book. So uh, do give us a like over on Facebook if you want to keep up with things there. So that does wrap it up for today. Thank you everyone for attending. Thank, Thank you, you, Sally, for sharing all the great books with us. And we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Oh, our next session is, oh, I should make that. Uh, our next one on Encompass Live, which is a textbook program is not for us. Reimagining failure into new possibilities. This is uh, something interesting. Yes. Um, UNO, the University, University of Nebraska in Omaha, tried to do a um, textbooks reserve, reserve pilot project, and it didn't work out so well. And they're going to come and talk to us about that. Heidi and Tammy will be here from UNO to tell us what they did and how it um, wasn't exactly as successful as they wanted to and what they're doing now. Cool. Not everything, and it's good. You can learn from your failures just as much as your successes. So please do sign up for that one next week and any of our other upcoming shows. All right. Thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.